avant tout, permettez-moi de remercier les organisateurs de cette conférence pour l'invitation, et non seulement pour l'invitation, mais aussi euh, pour leur euh, assistance, euh, accueil, hospitalité cordiale. Et, deuxième chose, euh, j'avais préparé une présentation en anglais, et donc je vais faire ma présentation en anglais. Mais si à la fin euh, vous avez des questions à poser, euh, vous pouvez les poser dans la langue que vous préférez. When I was invited to submit a challenging question as title for my presentation, I submitted how green is the history of green power. Uh, the word green is generally used to define non-fossil fuels for the production of energy. Uh, sometimes uh, green is considered as an equivalent of renewable, though this assumption is not totally correct, in my opinion. Fossil fuels, uh, gas, coal, oil, are considered the main responsible for the acceleration of climate change and the scientific community. Uh, there is widespread consensus towards the transition to green, ener to green energy production and on the fact that uh, uh, this transition to a different balance of sources is absolutely necessary. However, uh, the dream to decarbonize energy production is an old one, actually. Uh, electric power stations were only the latest productive activity that needed coal. Before then, the steam had already drove uh, locomotives and trains, the engines of ships. Uh, they were all produced by burning coal. And in the second half of the 19th century, some people was already wondering how long this would last. Uh, Augustin Mouchot, who was a professor of mathematics in Tours, Uh, wrote in 1879, uh, a day will come when industry will no longer find in Europe the resources needed, uh, the resources needed to keep up with its prodigious expansion. There is no doubt that all the coal will eventually be consumed. And what will industry do then? And a few years later, another engineer in Montpellier warned, today we are consuming the reserves of energy accumulated in millions of years. Industry is drying up this savings account and one wonders how much longer we will be able to make withdrawals from it. Uh, Mouchot started uh, researching about the possibility of producing energy Uh, through the heat of sun, and he studied uh, ancient experiments, and his attention was captured by uh, the ancient technology of concave mirror concentrators of solar rays, uh, which the ancients called uh, burning glasses. Uh, working with the mirror technology, Mouchot managed to develop the first solar motor, which generated enough steam to drive machines and uh, demonstrated it at the Paris exhibition in 1870, in the late 1870s. According to the surviving description, it was a gigantic lampshade with its concavity turned towards the sky. However, Mouchot's work gave rise to public discussion But in the end, the conclusion was not encouraging. Uh, the potential of solar energy was real, but it was believed that it did not offer significant opportunities, at least for France at that time. It was also thought that it would have been a different matter for hot and dry regions where the difficulty of procuring other kinds of fuel would increase the value of solar technologies. Uh, no one was thinking at that time that oil would be found <laughs> in those regions and so solar energy had to be postponed again. 
another advocate of solar energy in that period was John Erickson. Erickson was uh, nowadays a well-known Swedish-American engineer who made fundamental contributions to the development of technologies based on steam. Uh, Eriks, Ericsson also was concerned by the prospect, however distant, of running out of coal and was so convinced of the potential of solar energy that he uh, dedicated a number of years of work to the development of solar engines. After an initial period tinged with enthusiasm, however, his optimism faded. In effect, his pragmatism as an engineer and as an entrepreneur had made him observe that the cost of the equipment he had devised would not be competitive with respect to coal and therefore it had no real chance of being developed, at least for a long time. Uh, his conclusion was, uh, quote, although the heat does not cost anything, the concentration equipment is too large, expensive and complex. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, however, other attempts were made uh, to develop other ways of uh, using solar energy based not on the exploitation of solar heat through the steam, but on the direct transformation of light into electricity uh, through photo photochemical processes. Uh, this different technological approach was developed in the field of telecommunications from the observation made during the laying of the transatlantic telegraph cable, uh, which had led several of the, uh, which had led several uh, engineers responsible for checking the cable uh, to notice that the chemical element, uh, selenium, emitted electric current when it was exposed to light. The demonstration of this phenomenon and attempts to exploit it took place a long time before it was explaining before it was explained at the beginning of the 20th century. After the discovery made by the engineers on the open sea, two British scientists, uh, William Adams and Richard Day, studied this effect, which they called photoelectric. In this line uh, of research, an American inventor, Charles Fritz, from New York, in 1885, barely three years after the construction of uh, the Pearl Street Power Station of Edison in New York, uh, built the first photoelectric panel. Fritz sent his resultant panels to Werner von Siemens, the founder of one of the, larger, the largest electricity companies in Europe, and uh, also an author of studies on the electrical properties of selenium. Uh, the device impressed Siemens, who presented them to the Royal Prussian Academy of Sciences, uh, emphasizing the scientific importance of the first direct conversion of lying to electricity. From the industrial point of view, however, uh, Fritz devices did not offer better perspectives uh, than uh, Mouchot and Ericsson. Uh, not only because uh, of their cost, but also because the transformation of light into electricity was extremely inefficient and only a tiny fraction of the light uh, striking the panel uh, was converted into electricity. Also in Italy there was an interest in solar energy uh, which the transcription of uh, the patents of Mouchot and of his partner Abel Pifre, and there were also some applications for patents by Italian inventors. Uh, these early experiments in the field of solar energy tell us uh, at least two important things. The first is that the fears of those who supported uh, research in this direction was not based on, you know, on 
the concern for for environmental damage, which is our concern, but on the possible exhaustion of fossil fuels. The second is that the second is the question of cost. Cost plays a crucial role in the development of any technology, and therefore no renewable source has serious industrial prospects until its level of efficiency and the economic situation will make it economically competitive. It is also interesting to note how the two technologies for exploiting solar energy, the use of the heat as a substitute for fuel and the direct transformation of light into electricity, are present in parallel fashion from the beginning in the history of this kind of energy. Uh, actually, energy transition involves huge amounts of money. Uh, however, even poor energy management has economic, environmental, and socioeconomic costs. So it is true of energy what has been said about education. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Now, uh, I will present some case studies from the history of Italian energy transitions uh, between effectiveness and delusions. Italy is a country with abundant green resources, plentiful sun, mountains and waterways, rain, wind, and also geothermal resources. Because of this wealth of renewable resources and the scarce presence of fossil fuels, on the other hand, we have long since developed the habit of thinking about the ways of transforming first hydraulic and geothermal and then wind and solar energy into electric energy. Uh, actually, Italy has been a leader in the field of hydroelectric energy, as is shown by the construction already at the end of the 19th century of the first large hydroelectric plants in Europe. Uh, the first was the Bertini power plant in Paderno d'Adda. The first example of an impressive power production and transition at that time, but later on it is worth mentioning the enthusiasm that accompanied Italy's participation in the construction of the Aswan and Cariba dams in Africa. However, hydroelectricity had significant social downsides. The inhabitants of uh, the communities, the inhabitants of the communities which were, which were implied in, uh, in the construction of these dams, of dams uh, were really uh, important. Uh, they, had, they were forced to leave their houses and move to other places, and also a very uh, significant hydrogeological risk was involved. Uh, the most devastating example is the tragedy of the Vaillant Dam. The safety rules for dams were really strict. However, uh, a single mistake provoked more than 2,000 deaths, terrible and lasting destruction, enormous financial reparations to the hit communities, and no actual possibility of relocating them and resettle them in that territory. Uh, what is uh, paradoxical is the fact that the dam uh, was a masterwork of stability and the dam is still there, completely intact. Uh, the problem is that it was built in the wrong place it was not the dam which went down in the Vaillant tragedy. 
It was the basin, it was the mountain uh, behind the basin of the dam, which went down, filled the dam, and provoked a wave which uh, completely destroyed the valley down the dam. So it, it was uh, only one incident, but extremely uh, with extremely uh, terrible effects. Hydroelectric generation, which was in Italy the prevailing source of electricity since the beginning of the electric industry, had been a relevant factor in the success of the industrialist shift of the Italian uh, economic policy in the 1890s in the first decade of the new century, Italian policymakers perceived hydroelectricity as virtually unlimited and capable of freeing forever Italy from energy limitations caused by the scarcity of coal. Hydroelectricity was, remain, was renamed white coal, il carbone bianco. However, by the end of the 1920s, the disadvantages of this source and, the limited, and its limited increased potential had become clear, and Italian engineers were on the quest of non-fossil fuels for uh, integration and substitution. The first Italian research to mention the possibility of producing energy by breaking the energy bonds of atomic nuclei was Enrico Fermi, who did so at the end of the 1920s, and the idea echoed during the 1930s and the 1940s. Why non fossil fuels? Because fossil fuels would have again made the Italian economy dependent on the import of uh, energy sources. At the end of World War II, uh, the U.S. refused to give Marshall Plan funds for further development of hydroelectric projects, pointing out that only a substantial shift of the Italian electric system to thermoelectric generation could produce the uh, substantial increase of energy needed to support the extraction of the country and any further process of economic growth. Uh, which was later renamed the Italian miracle, the Italian economic miracle. Uh, it, was called, it was renamed in this way by a British newspaper at the end of the 50s. And so now the name is adopted in Italian as Miracolo Economico. Accordingly, the U.S. would support such a transformation and thermoelectric generation from oil and no longer from coal actually grew at such a pace to cover the acceleration of energy demand caused by the reconstruction and the growth of industrial production and the improvement of Italian lifestyle standards. It finally prevailed on hydroelectricity in 1966. The shift to thermoelectric made Italy dependent on oil import However, policymakers deemed it a temporary price for American support and for the benefit of the Italian miracle, but in the medium term, plans were made to find an alternative to oil. This was the perspective of nuclear program. You see, uh, it, it looked very attractive. However, the reality of the program was far from the, uh, from the expectations of the early years. Its development was entangled with political conflict, not only in the military field, but also mainly in economic policy, and also in academic finding for the control of groundbreaking research fields, such as physics, molecular biology, electronics, and engineering. Nevertheless, from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s, three nuclear power plants were built uh, 
together with important research facilities and research centers, and this was a very promising start. However, the sky was clouding, and in 1963-64, shortly after the electric nationalization, uh, with the creation of the uh, state-owned electric company, Enel, the nuclear agency created by the government was involved in alleged mismanagement of state funding. The political consequences slowed the pace of the nuclear program, with only one nuclear plant being built since then, uh, in 1980. This was the last uh, nuclear uh, power station built uh, in Italy. Uh, in addition, from the early 1970s, uh, the so-called green movements appeared on the Italian political scene. What is interesting and typical, I think, of the Italian political scene that is that at the beginning, these movements were not opposed to nuclear energy, but to uh, the, develop, the further development of hydroelectric plants, because they started, uh, th th these things started immediately after uh, the tragedy of the Vaillant Dam. And only after this, uh, at the beginning of the 70s, they shifted their attention towards uh, nuclear power stations. In fact, after the oil crisis of 1973, the Italian government had adopted an energy plan based on the massive building of nuclear power plants. And though the plan was clearly unrealistic, the industrial stakeholders of the nuclear program had prepared themselves in the reasonable perspective to realize at least a part of it. And the fact that only one plant was actually built had deep economic consequences. In addition, the nuclear program was an important flywheel for industrial innovation and scientific research well beyond the boundaries of closely related fields of energy production. And so its crisis deeply hit the Italian research and development system. When in 1987 a popular referendum canceled the nuclear program after the Chernobyl accident, phasing out uh, involved a new definition for the mission of the nuclear agency, which was now mandated with the commissioning of nuclear plants and the environmental remediation of nuclear sites. Uh, a state-owned company, Sogin, was mainly staffed by technicians coming from the nuclear agency, and they had the mandate uh, for the tasks on nuclear plants and sites. And the agency shifted the programs, uh, its programs to alternative, so-called alternative renewable energies and other research uh, programs. In 2008, uh, a new start of the nuclear program took place in the 2008, but was definitely stopped in 2011 because, of, again, of the reaction to a nuclear incident, the Fukushima accident. In the last 15 years, however, the denationalization of electric industry and its process of internationalization in a European framework have conspicuously challenged the Italian energy landscape and policies, thus changing the context of the nuclear debate. What we can learn from this story is that not only nuclear programs have costs when they are built, but also denuclearization has costs. And second, that the risk of nuclear plants are similar uh, to the risks of hydroelectric plants in a way. Uh, they are infrequent, but when they happen, they are very serious. And their sustainability depends on the organization of response in the affected country. I mean, uh, Soviet Union response to Chernobyl and Japan response to Fukushima were very different. And therefore, the sustainability of nuclear decarbonization actually varies from country to country and is deeply affected by political factors. Uh, Geothermal energy was mostly developed 
in central Italy at the very beginning of the 20th century, uh, the Italian state-owned railroad company, Ferrovia dello Stato, used geothermal energy to decarbonize the railroad transport by electrifying the rail network. Geothermal manifestations were given the evocative name of endogenous forces, uh, which emphasized the gushing up from the bowels of the earth. However, the main problem with geothermal energy is the constant need to drill new wells because of the decrease in steam emissions that occurs in wells after a period of time. Uh, furthermore, precautions are needed to reduce environmental impact on the surface of the areas and also underground because of the subsidence phenomena caused by the changing, uh, changes in the structures of the drilled fields. Solar energy too has downsides. Uh, with one of the most intense degrees of radiation, Italy has an excellent record in the solar field. The first solar power plant, uh, a steam plant, uh, was capable of producing steam at 450 Celsius degrees and was built in Genoa in uh, 1963. However, uh, photovoltaic extensive plants have a severe impact on agricultural land and landscape, and concentration steam plants have also impact on communities, the same of ele every electrical power plant. And the fact that they do not produce carbon emission is not enough for those communities uh, to accept them. On the other hand, we can't maintain our living style and standards without electricity and in general without energy. History shows that lighting and transport did change the perception, private and public, of the house and of the town. White and brown home appliances uh, are substantial parts of our daily life and in fact energy is a politically shared is a politically shared territory between socioeconomic system and material culture. Uh, so we have to accept that no energy production can come without environmental cost, and that current transition is neither the first, not the only in global history. Uh, new technological paradigms rarely cause a complete disappearance of existing technologies. As in any other field, even in energy, the use shifts to other fields or to niches where only those technologies can offer adequate responses to specific needs. Our future goes in a low carbon direction and any energy to come will have an environmental uh, impact. What we learn from history is that Transition sustainability does not depend only on available technologies, but also on their acceptance and responsible use. In other words, politics plays a role as important as research and development. The envisaged transition includes both technical and cultural aspects. This is where historical research can contribute to transition in shaping uh, adequate energy policies and shaping an education capable of promoting their acceptance. Through balanced public assessment, also acceptance of their, not only of their advantages, but also of their downsides. Uh, I think this is how history can play a role uh, through the better understanding of past transitions in the industrial era. Merci, Monsieur Paoloni. Je vais vous reposer votre, la question de votre conférence. Uh, je, je dois vous prier de parler, parler un peu, non, non doucement, mais haute voix, parce que je suis un peu sourd. D'accord. <laughs> Alors, je repose la question de votre conférence. L'histoire de l'énergie verte est-elle verte? 
est-ce que j'ai bien compris ce que vous avez dit en la résumant, en disant, on ne peut pas faire d'omelette sans casser les œufs. Est-ce que c'est un peu ce que vous nous dites? Euh... Vous connaissez l'expression, il faut casser les œufs pour faire une omelette. Euh... L'énergie verte, euh, a une histoire verte, mais pas suffisamment verte. Euh, il n'existe pas une énergie totalement verte, totalement sans conséquence. Et la question fondamentale, c'est d'accepter ce fait. Parce que ce fait implique, euh, implique le fait que euh, adapter, ad adopter une forme d'énergie euh, qui, qui réellement réduit les taux d'émission, ce qui est la chose vraiment importante pour nous. Parce que nous n'avons plus peur euh, de la fin du carbone ou de la fin euh, du pétrole ou de la fin du gaz. La peur que nous avons, c'est les émissions et leur effet en, en, sur, euh, sur l'atmosphère et sur le changement climatique. Le changement climatique est quelque chose euh, qu'on arrive à voir en Europe. Euh, c'est bien perceptible. Euh, non seulement pour les gens de mon âge, mais aussi pour les gens plus jeunes, parce que ça a accéléré beaucoup. Et il faut faire leur accepter que changer ce fait, réduire les émissions a un coût, et ce coût doit être payé. C'est un coût financier, mais c'est aussi un coût culturel. Et la politique n'a pas le courage d'affronter les aspects d'impopularité que certains de ces coûts comportent. Et je ne crois pas que ce soit pour inconscience, mais je crois que ce soit pour ignorance. C'est le fait, c'est le fait qu'ils ne savent pas exactement. Euh, ils, sa ils, ils trouvent un alibi dans le fait que la communauté scientifique semble, semble ne pas être, euh, de, ne pas avoir euh, 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 un consensus sur ce fait. En effet, il existe un vaste consensus de la communauté scientifique avec peu d'exceptions. Mais euh, cette excep ces exceptions euh, constituent un bon alibi pour les politiciens euh, qui enfin ont le seul objectif de vaincre la prochaine élection et qui ne pourraient pas vaincre la prochaine élection euh, en, en ne pas faisant quelque chose pour le changement climatique si l'opinion publique était formée à comprendre... Euh, le danger auquel tous nous sommes exposés. J'espère que ce soit la, la réponse à, à votre question. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your very interesting paper. I accept that no energy is without its costs. Oh. Uh, I accept that all energies are not completely green, that they all have a cost. And I suppose the question is, well, how long-lived is that cost? So CO2 is in the atmosphere for almost 100 years, which is why we focus on CO2. But in nuclear, nuclear waste is also persistent for decades to come. And in your research, when they're discussing nuclear power, do you think that they underestimate the true cost of looking after nuclear waste? 
Yes, I think this is true. But uh, uh, when I started my work as a historian of, uh, of, of research and the history of energy, uh, I, I was supportive of nuclear energy. Nowadays, I'm not supportive of nuclear energy. Uh, not uh, in, an, uh, in an absolute sense. But in the sense that I tried to point out in my presentation, acceptability of the nuclear risk is actually dependent on how the possible response to a nuclear incident is uh, organized. Uh, no human activity has zero risks. Who says so uh, is uh, lying and he knows he is lying. Uh, so the important thing is to minimize the risks and to minimize uh, the cost if an accident uh, happens. Uh, I'm aware now that Italy uh, is not, uh, would not be able to organize a good response to a nuclear accident. Uh, not, because, uh, not because our engineers are worse than other engineers. Uh, on the contrary, I think that they are absolutely perfect people in their profession. But the fact is that the decisions on making this organization work is not the decision of the engineers, is a decision of the political decision makers. And Italian decision, pol political decision makers, uh, when, uh, if a nuclear accident happened, would not uh, immediately keep the consequences and immediately decide to give a certain kind of response. They would try to, uh, to shift the responsibility, not to take the responsibility of making a decision. And this is uh, wrong. So this is why I think that we are not capable of uh, managing this kind of risk. Uh, I think that the case of Fukushima shows that the consequences of an accident can be reduced. And the consequences of Chernobyl accidents show that trying to hide the accident has a very, very, very high cost. And so, uh, this morning, uh, we had an impressive uh, presentation, uh, which was given by Pierre Lantier. And we... Uh, we could see that uh, the, new, the, the el electricity produced in France is based uh, for more than 70% on the nuclear source. Italy has uh, participated in the building of French nuclear power plants uh, because this was the only way uh, for our industry to find the market for the building capacity of nuclear technologies that on which they had invested when they thought that they, have, that they would build 20 nuclear power plants in Italy in 20 years, which was not the case. Not only 20, not even 10, only one. And so they had to, to, to export something and they participated in the uh, French uh, building of these uh, power stations. So I really think that the nuclear problem, the problem with nuclear is a problem of assessing uh, the ability of a country to, uh, how, how, how they do react in the case of accident. Uh, of course, uh, mm, no perfect country exists. And I think that in the long run, we should find a way of abandoning not only fossil fuels, but even 
uh, new nuclear thermoelectric generation. But for the moment, I think that the risks posed by the nuclear in the countries who are uh, who give the guarantee of being able to manage the risks uh, is in the short medium term uh, less uh, dangerous than uh, keeping uh, thermoelectric production from fossil uh, fuels but this is my opinion i mean i'm not an engineer i'm just an historian mm -hmm.